finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly or high places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Amen. May the Lord's rich blessing be to the reading of his word may be sanctified in our hearts. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, for the interest of your word gives light. Now we pray that you might speak to us that we might behold glorious, magnificent, splendid, and marvelous truth from your law to the end that our souls might be revived, our spirits might be lifted, and our minds might be calibrated to think the thoughts of God after you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to talk this morning from the subject of you better know who your enemy is. You better know who your enemy is. I was away this past week in, in Philadelphia at a pretty significant conference up there with men from all over the country talking about the plight and the ills and the problems facing urban America and men gathered from 24 major cities around the country to come and tell their stories about the struggles and what's happening in Charleston, West Virginia is no different from what's happening in Philadelphia, what's happening in Washington, D.C., Detroit, Los Angeles, Dallas, Cleveland, Columbus, Charlotte, you go on and on problem of academic failure among youth, the problem of violence among teens, the problem of dropouts, teen pregnancies, HIV increase, and on and on and on it goes. And just a litany of, of troubles. But while I was there, I had some time and I've been trying to get to this project. I love to read research material. And George Bonner is one of the leading Christian demographers in the United States of America. All of the major mega ministries, the MacArthur's, the Swindoll's, the Dallas Seminaries, they all use George, Mac uh, uh, George Bonner to, to do research in terms of trends in society in general and particularly trends within the Christian community. For four years, Bonner embarked upon a pretty ambitious project and that was to do an analysis of the African American church. Uh, there was no scholarly work done in terms of a thorough survey on the African American church, its trends, its beliefs, and so forth, and so Barna set out on this very, very industrious and very ambitious project. So he has compiled all of his findings. There was a couple of things that were quite interesting. Barna asked a question in his survey that he'd also asked white evangelicals, which is where much of his work has been done. And the question basically was, do you believe in the total and accurate infallibility of the Bible and all of its teachings? And so it's kind of interesting, the results that came back from Bonner's survey, that the accurate number should have been 75%, 75% of all blacks said they believe that the Bible is infallible and true in all of its teachings. 53% of whites said they believe the Bible is true and infallible in all of its teachings. And 60% of Hispanics say they believe the Bible is true and infallible in all of its teachings. And 58% of black teenagers said they believe the Bible is infallible and true in all of its teachings. Then Barna asked another question. And the second question was, do you believe that the devil or Satan, do you believe he's real or is he not a living being but a symbol of evil? So Barna asked the question to all these people who say they believe the Bible. 59% of blacks said that they don't believe that the devil is real. They only believe he's a symbol of evil. 58% of whites say they don't believe that the devil is real, that he's only a symbol of evil. 71% of Hispanics said they don't believe that the devil is real. He's just a symbol of evil. And 49% of black teens say that they don't believe the devil is real, but a symbol of evil. But herein lies the problem. All these Bible-believing adults 58, 59% of blacks, 58% of whites, 71% of Hispanics say they don't believe that the devil is real. More black teens say they believe the devil is real than adults. Now that's interesting. 
Therein lies the problem. We believe the Bible is the inerrant, authoritative, infallible word of God, but we don't believe what it teaches. <laughs> therein lies the problem. And therein lies the great problem that plagues us society today. If we do not have transcendent truth, if we do not have absolute, authoritative, transcendent truth, then it's very difficult to set a true north in terms of distinguishing between what's right and what's wrong. Now, I just want to focus this morning because we're going to do a whole series on some of this research that George Barner has, has put together for us. But I want to focus this morning on this whole idea of the devil. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, Flip Wilson was one of the most popular comedians in the United States of America and abroad. And Flip would always say, the devil made me do it. Well, that may have been true, but you know, we can do bad all by ourselves. Right. We don't need the devil to help us do bad. As a matter of fact, some bad the devil get blamed for, I didn't know even if the devil would do it or not. <laughs> but the devil is a real person, and we want to establish that this morning because in the mind of the theologians of the New Testament Bible, in the mind of Jesus, in the mind of Paul, in the mind of Peter, in the mind of John the Revelator, they all believed that the devil was a real spiritual person, not merely just a figment of somebody's imagination. Right. And so we got to decide who we want to believe, the authors of the New Testament canon, or do we want to, want to believe these Johnny-come-lately New Agers, these postmodernists who no longer believe that we know what the truth is. Right. Now, I'm a Bible preacher, so we're going to go back to the text. In this text, in Ephesians 6, Paul is coming to the end of the greatest theological treatise in the New Testament. He has dealt with the most weighty doctrine of theology that the Bible deals with in the book of Ephesians. And so he comes to the end, and what he says is, brothers, I don't care how much you know about predestination, election, foreordination, the mystery of the church, the principalities and the powers. He says, finally, brethren, here's what you better know if you're going to survive spiritually. Amen. So the first thing Paul does is he gives us and the church of Ephesus an admonition. He says, finally, brethren, Ephesians 6.10, right. finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. So the admonition is, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, and it could have been literally translated, be strong with strength. He says, be strong in the Lord, and it has an inner strength, his might, and an outward manifestation of his strength, his power. So he says, be strong with the power of God and be strong with the inner strength of God. And how do we get that? Ephesians 5, 18. We be filled with the Spirit. So he says, the admonition is be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Secondly, the admonition says, be clothed with the Lord's armor. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, the strength of his might, and put on the full armor of God. Now, that verb there, put on, in the Greek text, it's in the Eros imperative. And for you Greek scholars, y'all can look it up, and you'll know that I went to the Greek text, I know what I'm talking about. The Eros imperative, what it carries is the idea of action that has to be repeated continuously. So what Paul is saying, putting on the whole arm of God, is not getting a shot of right God in the morning, one shot and you're good for the whole day, you see. No, he says, when you put on the armor of God, you must be continually putting on the armor of God. It is an ongoing process to where you are consciously putting on the armor of God. So he says, you've got to be strong in God's strength, you've got to be clothed in God's armor, and then he says, you must be able to stand be standing against the wiles, the King James says, the schemes, the New American says, of the devil. Now what is he, Paul saying? What he's saying is, is that the devil, he has schemes, strategies, methodologies, different modes of operandi. And so back in the day, us old schoolers, we would say different strokes for different folks. Right? He had different strokes, he has different strokes for different folks. So people who are power hungry and who are egotistical, well, that's a scheme. His scheme for them is to bait them. His scheme is to tempt them with power and with control and with to manipulate and to oppress people. That's one scheme. 
for people basically who have lustful desires for money and for wealth, then you will tempt them in, in that area by tempting them with schemes to get rich and to get wealthy and so forth. For those people of wandering eyes and who cannot control their sexual appetite, their sexual desires, then his scheme is to addict them to sexual perversion, which will basically pollute and destroy their entire lives. We see great, powerful men and women falling down crumbling into a heap because they cannot control the passion that becomes his scheme. So he says, if we are, the admonition is, we've got to really understand. We've got to be, understand, first of all, that we must be strong in the Lord because we're no match for him in our own power. Right. And we must be clothed in the armor because we've got to be, have a defense system to defend us against his attacks. But we must be intellectually and spiritually aware of what's going on of his different schemes, his wiles, and his strategies. So there's no time to put your mind in neutral, you see. So that's the admonition. Secondly, the thing I see in this text is I see the activity. The activity. And it's right there in the text. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil for we wrestle, the King James says, I like that translation. We wrestle, we struggle, the New American Standard says. But the King James says we wrestle. And it really cares more of the literal translation from the Greek text. Now many of you here love sports and athletics. 40 NBA games and 40 nights. There are more men I know suffering from sleep deprivation over these 40 days than what you want to know. Because them West Coast games, they don't start at 10 o'clock. So you got to see Amari Stoudemire, and you got to see these boys because they got the most exciting team to watch. And they come on the latest on the West Coast. But in almost every sport, what you find is there's a period in the athletic contest where the rules of the game allows the game to be stopped. In basketball, fast-paced game, every time the ball goes out of bound, the whistle blows, the game is stopped. You can catch your breath. Every time there's a foul committed, the game stops. You can catch your breath, you see. In football, you got 40-some seconds to run a play. They line up, you run the play. Uh, there are massive collisions that take place on the field. When the action stops, the referee blows the whistle. The game stops. Everybody gets up, staggers back to the huddle. They got 40-some seconds to come back and run another play. They catch their breath. In tennis, you play tennis back and forth. Most volleys, particularly the men's volleys, because they hit the ball so hard, most volleys normally only last a couple of minutes at the very most. Ball goes out of bounds, game stop, you go back, you catch your breath. Same thing in soccer, ball goes out of bounds, even though the clock doesn't stop, you kind of catch your breath, the ball on the other side of the field, you catch your breath. You see, you got an opportunity to catch your breath. But there's one sport where you can't do that, and it's Greco-Roman wrestling. An expert says it may be the most strenuous of all athletic contests. Because first of all, the, the, the wrestlers, they are so conditioned because they have to make these weights and the tolerance is so small and they are so physically conditioned, their bodies are so physically fine-tuned and they're so skilled, you see. Now, I'm not talking about the WWF, y'all. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking about real wrestling, what you see in the Olympic Games. Now, follow me. So what happens when they line up in that center circle, and the referee allows them to get their grip and so forth, and then he starts the contest. If either one of those wrestlers, if they relax for a split second during the contest, the other wrestler is so skilled that he would have him pinned on his back just like that. And so their contest, it is perpetual, it is ongoing, it is tense. Every muscle in their body is tense and engaged because they know just one second, a split second, and the party is over. The head is in the mat. They flat on their back. Case is closed. That's what Paul is describing here. He said, you are engaged in a spiritual wrestling match. That's the activity. It is a strenuous struggle. And he says, if you're not careful, if you relax just for one split second, the enemy is going to have you on a spoil Nelson, and you're going to be hollering uncle. If you're not careful, you're in a spiritual wrestling match. It is hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's up close. It's personal. And the enemy is trying to do you spiritual harm. Amen. A spiritual wrestling match. A strenuous struggle. Paul says we are wrestling. That is the activity. 
So the admonition, be strong in the Lord, be clothed with the Lord's armor, be standing against the devil's schemes. The activity, a spiritual wrestling match, a strenuous struggle. Now look at the adversary. The adversary. He says, for our struggle, verse 12, is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers, against the powers, against the forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in higher places. Now just stop right there. The adversary. The adversary is the devil, the diablos. And his name in the Greek means adversary, you see. He's the adversary, Satan, the accuser of the brethren. And so Paul, Jesus, John, James, all the New Testament writers, they describe Satan as a real spiritual person. He's invisible, but he's real. God is invisible, but he's real. John 4, 24 say God is a spirit. God is a spirit. God is an invisible spirit. And Satan is an invisible spirit. But he's real. And he's a real person. He says, so your adversary is an invisible spirit, not flesh and blood. And it's hard sometimes for us to distinguish against just bad people and just evil people and a satanic manifestation in a person. So Satan is always looking for a beachhead for his activity of a human being to work in and through, to wreak havoc in God's system, to disrupt God's program or God's plan. Are you following me? So he is an invisible spirit, yet he is a real person. And you can check those references. In Genesis chapter 3, you remember the account, right? The serpent comes to Eve, but the serpent has been possessed by the spirit Satan. And so the serpent beguiled, deceives Eve. She didn't give the fruit to her husband and he eats. Their eyes are open. The whole human race plumbs into sin. A real spiritual person that works through another being. Are you following me? He's a powerful person. Turn just quickly to Job. The Old Testament book of Job. Job chapter 1. And because it's important for us to, to understand these principles before we look at what else Paul is having to say to us. I'm not going to be much longer, so don't get restless on me up in here. This is Grace Bible Church, right? Amen. Grace Bible Church. So we're supposed to read the Bible and look at the Bible and talk about the Bible. Amen. In Job chapter 1, verse 6, he says, Now there was a, a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless, upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear you for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You bless the work of his hand, and his possessions have increased. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. This text. So it says, the angels, the sons of God. That's an Old Testament way of describing the angels. Those that were created by direct fiat. God spoke the angels into existence, so they're referred to as the sons of God. You read the Bible closely, Adam is referred to as the son of God because Adam had no earthly parents. God spoke him to existence from the dust of the earth. So the sons of God, the angels appear before God, and there's Satan is in the midst of them. So why do you think that you can come to church and he wouldn't be up in here in some form? We're talking about up in heaven. We're talking about the angels show up in heaven before the true and the living God, and Satan is in the midst of the angels. Even though he has been defrocked and stripped of his spiritual authority that he had in heaven, when he was Lucifer, the anointed cherub, when he was the highest ranking of all the angels, and he was stripped, defrocked of that 
power and authority because he tried to lead an insurrection against God, and so God kicked him out of heaven, his abode of authority in heaven, along with one-third of the angels who were seduced by his clandestine scheme, but he still has access to talk to God. And so the Lord said, well, Satan, what's up with you? And Satan said, I'm just going to and fro. I'm just going to and fro, just passing time. Just passing time. You read the text closely because the Bible interprets the Bible. I don't have time to turn there, but these uh, uh, audio crats back here, they can probably get it for you. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter says, you got to be sober. You got to be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So what Peter does, he elucidates and he finishes what Satan didn't tell God. Satan said, I'm just going to and fro. What he didn't say, seeking whom I may devour. Peter says he's going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. God, the divine know-it-all, knew exactly what he was up to. God said, well, have you tried Job? Have you tried Job? I know what you're up to. Have you tried Job? He's my trophy. He's my masterpiece. None like him. Upright, righteous. He hates evil. He loves righteousness. He's respected, a man of integrity. Have you tried Job? You know, every now and then God might say to the enemy, have you tried? And you can put your name in there. Sometimes you catch hell, not because you've done anything wrong, you're just catching hell because the enemy knows you're trying to do something for God and he knows you mean business for God. He can't stop you, so he wants to try to harass you and try to discourage you. Amen. And every now and then, God will allow him to have access in our lives to try us so that God can show that we love him just because of who he is. So Satan says to God, no, no, Job is not serving you just because he loves you that much. Job is serving you because you've been breaking stuff off for him. You broke out a lovely wife. You gave him a bunch of kids. You broke off all these cattle, livestock, and land. He's the wealthiest man in the East. That's the only reason he's serving you. You let me take his stuff from him, and he will curse you to your face. And God said, go for it, dog. He said, but you can't touch his body. You can't touch his person. You read the record for yourself. In one day, all of Job's kids got killed. And one day, all of his livestock was gone. And one day, the mortgages came and foreclosed and took everything that he had. And that sweet, lovely wife said, you fool. You ought to curse God and go ahead and die. And God, and Joseph, you don't know what you're talking about. Can we just take good from the Lord and not accept the bad? The Lord giveth, he said, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You read the text further. God and Satan, another conversation. Satan said, well, he just served you because he just got back from the doctor and he got a health report and he's going to live to be 100 plus. You let me touch his body, he'll curse you and die. Satan goes back and afflicts him with disease, boils all over his body. Job sitting out there, just a pitiful, emaciated mess. But he refuses to curse God. Amen. And in the end, you got to read the whole book. And Job never did know what was going on. And he never did figure out what was happening to him. And never did God tell him until the very end. And even at the end, he didn't tell it all to him. So we see what Satan is trying to do. Remember Jesus told Simon Peter? He said, Simon, Satan wants you. And he wants to sift you like wheat. He wants to rip you apart, rip you apart. He said, but I pray for you that your faith won't fail. Amen. And then when you're victorious, you can strengthen the brothers. And so when you go through something by the grace of God and it don't kill you, it don't cause you to curse God foolishly and you maintain a testimony and when you come out on the other side, you can strengthen the brothers and the sisters that God is faithful even in the dark places of life. Amen. Well, y'all living large. But this don't excite y'all souls. So I'm going to hurry up and finish. The adversary is real, invisible, spiritual person with power, and he's deceptive. He's deceptive. Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter four. The apostle Paul pens these words. 
He said, if our gospel is hid, it's hid to those who are lost. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are lost and who are perishing. He says, because the God of this age has blinded the eyes of those who do not believe, lest the glorious light of the gospel should shine unto them, and they believe and be saved. Bonner quotes in his analysis of the African American church a gentleman by the name of Thomas Freeman, who was one of the preeminent economists, social scientists in this country at Harvard University, not exactly a bastion uh, for a commitment to evangelical Christianity. But Freeman writes, listen to this, and you'll love this, Brother Ed. Freeman writes, he's issued a report, he's analyzed the African American community. Everybody's studying black folk now, that's in vogue now. Because the situation is so bad everywhere, education, over-incarceration, you name it, the social pathology is beyond belief, so everybody is studying and announcing, printing reports, and making money. Well, that's what Freeman says. Freeman says the number one deterrent, based on his exhaustive research, of keeping black kids out of jail, off of drugs, and out of high-risk situations, what you think it is? He didn't say mamas and daddies. As a matter of fact, Freeman said, based on his study, poor kids who are in church and Sunday school are adjudicated delinquent less than middle class and upper class kids who are not there. Poor kids who are in Sunday school and church are less likely to get involved in crime and in violence. So what Freeman concluded, that the best power to help kids in communities are getting them in good churches where the Bible is preached, where there's a nurturing community with high expectations, and where they are valued and they are challenged to moral excellence. See, we're trying to fix something, and we keep saying the same thing because somebody told us that's what we ought to say. People keep trying to say, well, you got to get the parents involved. Some kids just got trifling parents. That's not their fault. It's not their fault their parents are trifling just won't do what they're supposed to do. That's not their fault. And so that's where the church comes in, the new community. The church comes in and creates a new family, a new community with high expectations, with discipline, and with nurture. And that's what I tell the young guys around here. Now, I can help you if you'll let me talk to you, if you'll let me speak to you in your life, if you're listening when I tell you you're doing something stupid, you're doing something stupid. I'm just not making it up. I didn't get up that morning to try to make life miserable for you. You're doing something that is self destructive. I testified on Wednesday night. I testified of going through the neighborhood, saw a young kid that I know, turned my car around and went and picked him up because God just, just burned me to do that. And he got in the car. I took him over there. You saw him when he came. He spent two and a half hours over there analyzing. I said, man, you better get off the street. These people mean business, man. I saw him one day and I met with the U.S. Attorney's Office. I met with the Sheriff's Department. They going to lock you guys up. They mean business, and rightfully so. You guys out here carrying guns like this is the wild, wild west, and people are just sick and tired of it. And every time they can, they're going to drag you into the federal court. They got the whole thing. They're they, they, they tired of this, and rightfully so. I said, look, you got to get off the corner, man. I see you selling drugs, but I ain't even looking for you. I'm not even looking for you, and I see you doing it. I pleaded with him. Took him over to try the same whole job program. I got home from Philadelphia yesterday, coming down the street, stopped by the house where he lived, saw his girlfriend sitting on the porch, and I said, where is such and so in Sonia? So tell him to come out here and talk to me. And she dropped her head and started crying. I said, Rev, he, he locked up. He said he's out there in the corner, and the gun fell out of his pocket, and it went off, and somebody called the police, and the Charleston PD, PD showed up, and they found him with five grams of crack in his pocket. They called the U.S. Marshals. The U.S. Marshal showed up, and they locked him up, and they, and they charged him with possession with the intent to deliver five grams of crack cocaine, felony, five years in federal penitentiary, unlawful firearm, five more years. That's the law. That's the law. And they're trying to warn people. I got a whole box of brochures in my trunk of my car. I've been going out handing them people. These people mean business. They're sick and tired of it, and rightfully so. So you tell all of your boys out there on the street, they think they can pack like this a wild, wild west if they want to. They go into penitentiary, federal penitentiary, and there is no parole. There is no parole. And this young man is 20 years old, and he's looking at potentially 
minimum of 10 years, five for the five grams of crack, five more for the weapons, and if the feds start bringing folk up in there that just will lie and say he sold me drugs too, they add that on relevant conduct, and he might end with 20 years. It happens. It's happening every day. You, you got young guys around here, man, that's why we're trying to talk to you. This ain't no game. This is serious business. If you survive out there from getting shot out there on the street corner, you're going to get caught by the feds. Because the federal government gets you when they want to get you. They ain't got no time on their side, and they got plenty of money to do it. And these bad, ain't nobody bad when they get arrested by the feds. Everybody supposed to be bad when they get, no, not when they get arrested by the feds, man. They start singing like mockingbirds, man. They're telling their mamas if necessary to get to quit from doing that big time. Sister Nancy Hill, former federal prosecutor, she know I ain't lying. I talked to the federal prosecutor attorney. I was down there with Mother Day. I want to understand what's going on so I can warn these young folk to understand, man, this ain't no game. I was up in Philadelphia. You know what they're doing in Philadelphia? The guys run the streets in Philadelphia. They run the corner, and they lease the block. The sale of drugs in North Philadelphia, you got to pay $1,500 to stand on the corner. She from Philadelphia. You can't stand on that corner unless you pay the man $1,500 who controls that corner. And if you don't pay, you're not going to be out there. And this is, it's coming here. It's coming here. Because it's getting so bad in Philadelphia and Detroit, they're coming to West Virginia. And this is a scheme of the devil. Deceiving these young people into thinking, man, I can get out of here, I can sling drugs, bling, bling. I can get me spinners on my car, have all these. Now, you're going to penitentiary, man. you go going to penitentiary, I'm telling you. I ain't trying to be funny. you going to penitentiary. Follow me for a week, and I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'll take you out to South Central Regional Jail. People you think going out of town, man, they're up at South Central waiting to get sentenced, I'm telling you. Waiting to be sentenced. Either by the feds or by the state. There is no good excuse for selling drugs. I'm sorry. There is no good excuse for selling drugs. There is no good excuse for po poisoning people. There is no good excuse for it. Amen. And we've got to quit giving people lame duck excuses. There is no excuse. If you're hungry, somebody will give you a sandwich. Amen. If you need shoes, somebody will give you a pair. There is no excuse for it. And we've got to go back to the moral high ground and quit trying to make excuses. Because this scheme of the devil is destroying our community. And I didn't mean to get off on all of that, but the God of this world is blinding the eyes of those who don't believe. He's blinding the eyes. And that's why we've got to be relentless and persistent and just determined to try to reach as many of these young people as we can with the gospel. Bonner's research also shows that all the black teenagers who, who profess to be Christian 90% of them made their profession before they were 16. And after 16, the, the, the number of people who come to Christ dramatically drops off. The schemes of the devil to keep young people blind to the truth, to think them, to, to lead them to believe in that serving God and, and being a Christian is, is not for young people. It's not something they should give their lives to. And so their eyes are blind. A deceptive spiritual person. And lastly, a destructive spiritual person. Your adversary, invisible but real, powerful, deceptive, and destructive. Jesus said the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and destroy. We got to know who our enemy is. Somebody saying, man, we're preaching. You can paint a pretty bleak picture here. We got this invisible enemy we can't see. And he has power and access to God. And he has an orderly rank of soldiers, powers, principalities, dominions, spiritual wickednesses in high places. I mean, how can we win? I'm glad you asked the question. And that's why Paul said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. And Paul says to the church at Rome, he says that what can separate us who can separate us from the love of God? Can tribulation or distress? Can persecution or sword? Can peril or nakedness? He says, for I am persuaded, neither life nor death, 
angels, principalities, things present, things to come, height, no death, life, no death. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. We win in the end. All we have to do down here is to occupy until he comes. And we keep holding up the bloodstained banner, telling boys and girls and men and women that the ways of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That if any man be in Christ Jesus, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that God is a God of love and mercy and grace and forgiveness. And we bring our tired, weary, sinful souls to the throne of grace. There we obtain mercy and we find grace to help us in our time of need. And God will pick us up and he'll wash us off and he'll fill us with his Holy Spirit and he'll give us purpose and meaning and direction and he will propel us through this life to do something significant for him. We win in the end. So we ought to be aware and we ought to be enlightened but not intimidated not intimidated by the enemy, not deceived or manipulated by his schemes or his wiles because we are more than conquerors. We are super conquerors through the one who loves us. Amen. But what is a super conqueror? Well, the best way that I know to illustrate this is in terms of a boxing match. Get two men, or in today's economy, women. I'm sorry, I just can't get in to watch these women box. I just can't get into this. But they fight for the championship, and they will wage a titanic contest, a pugilistic slugfest, blood and snot flying everywhere. And they going down, and they getting up, and getting knocked through the ropes, but coming back, no one is relenting, nobody gives up, and they go to full distance. 12 rounds, and they can barely stand. But one of them just in the last 30 seconds out of a perfectly even match. He's able to win the last 30 seconds, and therefore, on the judge's card, he gets a split decision. And they come out, and they bring the belt, and they strape the belt around his waist, and they raise his arms in the air that he's the new heavyweight champion of the world, and the people cheer, and he's a conqueror. He conquered the foe. He conquered the opposition. He conquered conquered the enemy, but in, in, in the terms of the contract, there was a $20 million purse. And so they step up in the ring and they bring the $20 million and they prepare to hand him the $20 million and he sticks his hand out to get his $20 million and between his hand and between the manager's hand, there's a little small miniature hand that's connected to a body that weighs no more than a buck and 10 pounds and it's a pretty little thing called his wife and she takes the $20 million. Now, he's a conqueror because he won in the arena of conflict. And he waged war in the arena of conflict. And he shed blood in the arena of conflict. And he conquered his flow, and he was declared to be the champion. He's a conqueror, but she's a super conqueror. She's more than a conqueror. Ain't shed no blood, ain't had no sweat that was shed, clothes ain't messed up, hair didn't sweat back. She just get the 20 million. More than a conqueror. Well, I start by to tell you, we're more than conquerors. Oh, yeah. Jesus went into the arena of conflict. He waged war at a place called Golgotha on Calvary's hill. And there the enemy unleashed the full fury of his wrath. And Jesus shed blood in Gethsemane, shed blood across the Via Della Rosa, shed blood on the cross. But in his blood being shed, he became a conqueror because they placed him in a tomb. But on the third day, he rose from the dead with all power in his hand. A conqueror, he said, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? A conqueror over death, over hell, over sin, and the grave. He's a conqueror. But in Christ, we're more than conquerors. We ain't shed no blood. We ain't go to the cross. We were nailed to the cross. But because Jesus did it for us, we received everything that he was on the cross. We're more than conquerors. And so we live like it. And so we wage war like it. And we live like we believe that the souls of men really are important and the souls of boys and girls really are important. And by God's grace, we're going to do all that we can do by the Holy Spirit to win people to save in faith in Jesus Christ. Even when there's an enemy out there that's trying to take us out. Well, I'm not through. I'm just out of time. And I thank you for yours. Let's pray together, shall we?